welcome from my side as well. Uh, about uh, 10 months ago, in April 2022, we had our previous uh, webinar on uh, alternative fuels uptake. And back then, um, we identified a trend of uh, an accelerated uptake of uh, new fuels, uh, mainly driven by LNG, but also methanol was uh, becoming part of the picture for the first time, I would say. So now, 10 months later, uh, what is happening? Uh, I dare to say that we are witnessing a historic moment in shipping. We're witnessing um, a fuel shift happening as we speak. And fuel shifts do not happen every year or every uh, generation. Uh, the last one happened actually a century ago when we went from coal to oil and it took several decades. Now we see something similar, uh, but uh, it's actually uh, a move from oil to several different fuels and uh, we expect this to happen even faster because the pressure is quite high. So before uh, looking at some of the numbers um, uh, explaining this uh, fuel shift, I think it's good to uh, go a little bit through the drivers and understand what is driving this and uh, uh, where is the pressure coming from. So uh, we see that, uh, of course, we have regulations, we have the IMO regulations, we have European regulations now, uh, but we also have uh, investors, we have uh, banks that are pushing for greener shipping. We see uh, cargo owners and charters that sometimes are dictating even the fuel choice uh, in some vessels. So the pressure is now coming from all sides and it's increasing fast. Sometimes it's increasing faster than uh, the absolute minimum requirements coming from the IMO. Uh, as part of this, uh, the life cycle uh, uh, greenhouse gas emission standards uh, for fuels that are under development both in the IMO and uh, in the European regulations are going to be essential for having uh, a common standard, having a common language uh, in a way as to which fuels are low carbon fuels or carbon neutral fuels and which are the fuels that we should use moving forward. So this is a very um, essential part of the uh, regulatory development um, uh, this year. Uh, so on one hand, we have the IMO regulations. So we had the first uh, measures coming into force uh, earlier this year. We know that uh, more are under discussion, but there is something very important happening uh, in the IMO, and this is the strategy review. Uh, this year, we should expect um, more clarity by NPC 8 in July. And on the other side, we have some European regulations coming uh, into force in the next couple of years. So I would like very briefly to talk about them. On the IMO side, uh, we all know that uh, by 2050, we need to reduce our absolute emissions by 50%, greenhouse gas emissions, and reduce our carbon intensity by 70%. Now there is strong pressure for going maybe all the way to zero. Some countries are arguing in the IMO that we should go to zero. It's very hard to predict what the outcome of these um, discussions is going to be, but we expect that we are going to end up somewhere between the current targets and zero. And uh, we should get that clarity by 2050. But I think it's very good to keep in mind that uh, the current targets may not be uh, what we comply with uh, in the long term. On the European side, uh, we see a very uh, high activity, I would say. We have a regulation coming into force in 2024, next year. That's the inclusion of shipping in the European emission trading system. There's a transition period for the first three years, and then there will be full inclusion. For now, this is covering, or, uh, this is covering all vessels that are subject to EUMRV, but there are already uh, discussions for including smaller vessels in the future. Um, this is a market-based mechanism um, based on carbon allowances that are available. These carbon allowances are going to be reduced by 4.2% every year, so obviously there is going to be a pressure for prices to go up. And you see that uh, over the last couple of years on the graph, uh, the prices have increased very significantly from around 10 to 20 euros per ton of CO2 to 100 euros of ton of, per ton of CO2 today. And this is actually the equivalent of $300 per ton of fuel. So for a vessel um, operating between European ports only, this can be up to a 50% increase in the fuel cost. Uh, and also for vessels um, uh, coming from uh, outside Europe, European ports, this can also be a significant related expenses. 
um, this will definitely incentivize the energy efficiency uh, for all ships subject to this. Uh, anything you can do to save here will save you money here. But also it could incentivize the use of something called advanced biofuels. And we'll talk a little bit about this later, but uh, this is one of the regulations that will uh, have an impact on um, uh, pushing uh, a bit more uh, of these fuels into the market. The other regulation that is coming in 2025, this is still under negotiation, uh, so we don't know the final form of it, uh, but we know it's 2025. It's a fuel EU maritime that for the first time is setting life cycle uh, emission requirements to marine fuels. There's a baseline based on the current uh, fuels used, which is for the most part fuel oil. And every five years, we need to use fuels with lower carbon intensity. It doesn't matter how efficient the vessels are, we need to still reduce the carbon intensity of the fuels that we're using. Uh, and if we look at this graph, uh, the green color at the very top, we see fossil methanol. This is methanol produced from natural gas, and this is the methanol that is for the most part available today. This methanol is actually moving in the wrong direction because it's produced from natural gas, and the life cycle emissions of it are higher than the current baseline. Uh, LNG, fossil LNG, uh, depending on what kind of engine technology you're using on board, can reduce emissions by up to 15%, and then you can be um, uh, complying up to 2035 or 2039, depending on uh, engine technology. And then at the very bottom of this graph, we see other fuels that can be biofuels or synthetic fuels that um, have a much higher potential for reducing the carbon intensity, uh, but here the rules are not clear yet. Uh, this is part of what is under discussion in Europe now, uh, the rules for um, um, for the life cycle assessment of these fuels. Hopefully we'll get some clarity a little bit later this year, and then we'll know exactly how these fuels are going to count uh, in this regulation. Uh, but for sure, we know that from 2025, when all ships calling European ports will have to comply with this, we'll have uh, a need to start using at least a certain amount of biodiesel, and then maybe uh, other uh, clean fuels like green methanol, for example, for the ships that will be running on methanol in order to comply with this life cycle regulation. So this is another very important regulation that is under uh, development that will definitely uh, incentivize the use of uh, all kinds of low carbon fuels and uh, that means that in the future we have to think of the whole fuel uh, value chain uh, it could be biomass or it could be clean electricity uh, for producing these fuels we need to certify the production maybe even the distribution of these fuels and we need to also make sure we verify emissions on board uh, depending on the mix between fossil and clean fuels that we are using. And uh, we at BNB, we are also through our other business areas, we're very proud to actually support the industry in this entire value chain from all the way from producing to uh, utilizing the fuels in board vessels. Now I would like to uh, show some numbers on what we see uh, in new building orders. And uh, on the left hand side here, we see number of vessels. On the right hand side, we see the same vessels expressed in gross tones. The 2023 numbers are based on January orders only, so they're relatively low numbers that can change during the year, but we see uh, also based on what we have already in February that is not reflected in the graphs yet, uh, we see these trends continuing. Uh, light blue at the top is conventional fuels, dark blue at the bottom is LNG carriers that almost by definition go on LNG, orange is other ship types on LNG as fuel, uh, and these are all dual fuel designs. And the yellow part that is emerging is methanol. The gray part that is relatively small, it's LPG that is very special to LPG carriers for now. So uh, the big um, change that we see is that based on gross tonnage, which is also reflecting uh, the size of the vessel and the fuel consumption, we're moving towards, uh, very clearly towards alternative fuels. So LNG fuel vessels and methanol fuel vessels. And this is also showing that it's mainly large vessels driving this change. Um, so uh, we actually um, 
concluded on these three main trends last year. We see them confirmed now and even uh, further accelerated. We see the share of alternative fuels increasing fast among new buildings, uh, mainly driven by large vessels. And we see that we are going to have a more diverse fuel mix. These vessels are not built yet. They are, most of them are in the order book. They will be on the water in a couple of years from now. And that's when they will start using these new fuels. If we look in particular at uh, two uh, segments, uh, I have here the container and the Roro and PCTC segment, containers on the left-hand side. We see that uh, all orders so far this year um, with either LNG or methanol. Uh, if you look at the uh, car carriers on the right-hand side, until last year, most of the vessels were ordered with LNG as fuel. This year, you see that dropping, but this is based on a small number of orders. We had some orders with conventional fuel, uh, and now we start seeing also this segment uh, assessing methanol. So it will be very interesting to see how 2023 develops in this segment as well. Uh, but uh, I would even ask the question if we have seen the last oil fuel container vessel, and uh, that might be true at least for the large containers. In other big segments, uh, in tankers, we have seen approximately 20% of the tonnage ordered since 2020 with LNG, and approximately 11% of the bulk carrier uh, tonnage. And these are mainly the large vessels in these segments again. So now uh, we have a small poll. I would need some help from Simon for this. Hi, everybody. So we're going to have a little bit of uh, a poll now. If you can click on the button, uh, that should be there, popped up on, on the right-hand side. So uh, what we're interested in today is if your company was ordering a new building in the next one to two years, which solution would be your most likely choice? Would it be a conventional fuel, uh, either very low sulfur or uh, with a scrubber or biodiesel, LNG, LPG, methanol, ammonia or hydrogen? And also, would there be or would there be a carbon capture solution contemplated or used? So we'll let those um, those res those uh, clips come through. Up to a third of you voted, if you we can get in there. That's fantastic. Right, so almost half of you voted there. And uh, let's have a look. We've got a, a very strong uh, favorite there in, in methanol, but with the conventional fuel and LNG uh, reasonably close behind. Uh, and, but uh, quite significant interest there in ammonia. So, Christos, what do you make of those results? Uh, first of all, I can say it's uh, very similar to the results we get this morning. So I think we have quite a big sample now of a few thousand people voting. Uh, we see one fifth uh, thinking of conventional fuel, um, maybe using biodiesel as well. And then uh, there's a still significant interest in LNG. I would think the LNG or LPG is mostly going towards the LNG uh, solution. Uh, and the methanol is, uh, as we say, the fuel that uh, has a very big growth. And uh, that's also something that we see in uh, new building discussions with many owners these days. So definitely this is something we see out there. And obviously there are many who are interested in ammonia or hydrogen, but this is not easy to order. If you want to order the next one or two years, you may have to wait a bit longer. And uh, we'll, we'll say a few words at the end about carbon capture. This is another technology that people uh, start becoming interested in. So definitely this reflects what we also see uh, out there. So uh, very good. Let's uh, move ahead with uh, uh, a few statistics on uh, LNG and LPG first, uh, what we call the established alternatives. Uh, we are now above 800 ships, uh, including the new building orders, um, uh, LNG ships. These are mostly new ships. The main reason people are selecting LNG is because of the benefits they have in EDI and CAI. And we have seen um, that this is mainly driven by large containers and car carriers. 
but we also see all other ship segments, uh, tankers, bulk carriers, uh, for example, uh, uh, being um, quite interested in LNG, and it's typically the largest vessels in these segments going for the fuel. Of course, we need um, some space for the fuel tanks. Um, the cost of building an LNG fuel ship is relatively high, and we also have the methane challenge, but here we see a lot of developments from engine makers. Uh, we also see a lot of development in uh, after treatment devices. So I think in the medium long term, this is not going to be a big problem. Uh, so LNG, uh, the interest for LNG is definitely still strong. Now, uh, LPG has been a very special fuel. It is only used on LPG carriers so far, um, but still it has some uh, potential benefits, uh, up to 15% reduction in carbon emissions. Uh, unfortunately, there are no four-stroke engines commercially available today, so you don't get the full potential of that fuel. Um, it's easier, a bit easier to handle an LNG. You don't have the cryogenic temperatures. That also means that the fuel tanks are not as expensive. Um, so it will be very interesting to watch that moving forward and see if any other C types are going to adopt it or if it's going to stay in this market for LPG carriers. For those interested in ammonia, LPG can be quite interesting because in an LPG tank, you can also have ammonia later. So um, this might be the technology that is closest to being ammonia ready. Uh, the other technology that is uh, uh, promising and many people are uh, hoping uh, for it uh, uh, and are getting ready to order when it's available, it's ammonia. Uh, still, engines are under development. Uh, the big engine makers, they have plans for bringing these engines to the market at the end of next year or up to mid-2025. There have been some delays, there is no secret about that, but uh, still the plan is that the first vessels will be on the water by sometime in 2025. From our side, we're developing class rules and actually updating them as we learn more from working with the industry. And we are also performing uh, bankering studies. The biggest one is uh, for Singapore uh, under the Global Center for Maritime Decarbonization. There is still quite a bit of work to be done to make sure that we can safely use ammonia on board. Um, and we think that the period, the second half of this decade, is going to be a testing period for the technology, for operations, and even availability of the fuel. So we'll definitely see some vessels uh, the second half of this decade. Uh, but it's going to take some time, also we need to develop the regulations, and then um, around 2030, if hopefully this experience is good, we can start seeing a wider uptake of methanol and fuel. Uh, hydrogen is another uh, low carbon alternative that uh, quite a few people are interested in. Uh, this is a very special, mostly for small vessels. Uh, here, the main, some of the main challenges is the size and the cost of the fuel tanks. You need quite significant fuel tanks. Uh, that means that it's mostly relevant for vessels that can bunker frequently, and this is typically smaller vessels. Uh, we see some vessels uh, now start using hydrogen, either in fuel cells, and we see some development for four-stroke engines. Um, there's a lot of work ongoing for scaling up fuel cells from a few hundred kilowatts to a few megawatts. So it will be very interesting to follow this technology and see if this can be applied for larger vessels also moving forward. Uh, but this is definitely uh, another option for uh, some vessel types at least. And uh, of course, we have a very large fleet of uh, existing vessels, and for them, uh, biofuels may be the option if it's not uh, easy to retrofit them. So we have started looking at biofuels, and my colleague, uh, uh, Seke Sander now, will uh, give us uh, an overview. Evint, you have control. Thank you very much, uh, Christos, and good day to everyone listening in. Uh, I will talk about a few topics uh, within uh, the biofuel theme, uh, ranging from the regulatory status uh, current uptake, and also a little bit about the future outlook within the maritime industry. Uh, but first of all, uh, what are uh, biofuels? Um, by definition, a biofuel is any fuel made from processing of biomass. 
there are various sources of biomass that may be turned into biofuels through different uh, processes. Examples of biofuels include BAME, uh, biomethanol, uh, ethanol, HVO, and liquefied uh, biogas. And, and the ones I mentioned now are not uh, exhaustive. Uh, these are fuels with very different uh, characteristics. Some have drop-in properties on existing conventional vessels running on fuel oils. Others, such as biomethanol and liquefied biogas, may be used on board uh, methanol fueled and LNG fueled uh, vessels. Uh, therefore, it's important to keep in mind that biofuels is a very generic uh, term and that it covers a wide range uh, of fuels with very different uh, properties. Uh, I think that it is the drop-in properties of my, many biofuels that make them uh, an appealing choice to achieve uh, decarbonization, especially for uh, existing vessels uh, where they can be blended together with uh, conventional fossil fuels, uh, giving a great deal of uh, flexibility. Uh, this is one of the reasons why we see uh, biofuels, uh, in particular FAME and HBO, being used uh, to a small degree as a ship fuel uh, today. And that brings us to the question, what is the, the current uh, uptake of biofuel within shipping? Um, and, and to answer this, uh, I will mention first that uh, for the last decade, several uh, shipping companies have trialed uh, biofuels, as you can see from uh, the news article screenshots on the show now on the left uh, hand side. Uh, most of the trials have been uh, initiated by cargo owners, including big car companies wanting to reduce uh, emissions in their value chain. Uh, we've also seen uh, owners of especially container vessels starting to use uh, biofuels on a regular basis as part of uh, service offerings to reduce uh, transport emissions to uh, customers. Uh, as a result of this, both Rotterdam and, and Singapore reported a, uh, reported a record-breaking of biofuels in 2022, a total of approximately 900,000 tons of uh, blended uh, fuels. Uh, typically, uh, this blended fuel may consist of uh, 20 to 30% uh, biofuel. So roughly speaking, we can therefore translate this to uh, 300,000 tons uh, pure uh, biofuel. Uh, the majority uh, of which will be FAME uh, biofuel, which is the most commonly tested uh, today. Uh, although uh, 300,000 tons might sound uh, like a lot to some, it, it's, it is still uh, only 0.1% approximately of the total uh, maritime energy mix in 2022. So it's still uh, you know, a very limited uh, amount. Uh, but uh, this value represents a very strong growth from uh, previous years, uh, at least. Uh, and, and I think, uh, as Christos also, also mentioned, if we are to see further increases in the use uh, of biofuels uh, and other uh, low carbon fuels for shipping in the future, a prerequisite is that uh, regulations incentivizing use are uh, put in place. And um, regulatory barriers need to be removed uh, as well. So next, we will take a, a quick look at the current regulatory status of uh, biofuels. Uh, and I think two items are critical uh, here. Uh, firstly, greenhouse gas uh, regulations uh, and also NOx regulations. When it comes to uh, greenhouse gas or GHG, use of biofuels today have no impact on the EXI uh, or EDI of a vessel. The reason is that only the carbon content of the fuel, uh, the fuel the vessel is designed for is uh, taken into uh, account. For CII, current guidelines do not cover the use uh, of biofuels, but if the vessel's uh, flag administration accepts, the use of biofuels also uh, in the form of uh, blends with traditional fuel oils 
could lead to significant reductions in CII. On this point, it's worth noting that at uh, MEPC 80, later this uh, year, the use of biofuels under CII will be uh, considered uh, explicitly, meaning that uh, in the future, in the not long, too long distance future, uh, CII guidelines might also cover uh, the use of uh, biofuels. Finally, under the EU's uh, MRV scheme, collecting emissions data from uh, vessels traveling to and from uh, EU ports, use of biofuels leads to a reduction uh, in the annual reported CO2 uh, emissions. And therefore, it follows that uh, use of uh, biofuel effectively reduces the number of uh, emission allowances needed to be purchased uh, in order to comply with the EU uh, emission trading uh, scheme that will enter into force uh, from next year. Uh, over to NOx regulations. This used to be uh, a significant barrier to the use of uh, biofuels on board vessels. The reason is that uh, proof was required to make sure that NOx emissions when using biofuels do not exceed uh, the uh, NOx limits stipulated by MARPOL. Uh, in practice, though, this was quite difficult to uh, prove, uh, and most owners opted to uh, apply for flag state uh, exemptions in order to use uh, biofuels. Last year, though, this regulation was uh, revised, and now uh, no NOx testing or assessment is required when using fuels with biofuel content below. 30%. Uh, for fuels with biofuel content above 30%, if uh, it is confirmed by the engine manufacturer that the engine can run on the fuel and no settings or NOx critical components need to be uh, changed outside those given in the approved technical file, then biofuel use is uh, permitted. Uh, you can find more details on what I've just talked about uh, on uh, the regulatory status of biofuels in our uh, newly published newsletter that you can see on the right-hand side uh, on your screens now. Moving on, uh, I mentioned earlier that some biofuels have drop-in uh, fuel characteristics for vessels uh, designed to run on conventional fuel oils. Uh, but there are still uh, possible challenges and consequences on board the vessel that should be uh, considered uh, bef before bunkering fuels with biofuel uh, content. Uh, so far, the testing and trialing of biofuels on board vessels has been mostly limited to use of FAME and HVO over relatively uh, short uh, time periods. And we have seen examples of challenges uh, with, uh, in particular, material uh, compatibility, where the fuel has uh, reacted with components found in uh, the fuel supply system. And we've also seen exact cases where um, fuel filters have been uh, plugged. Uh, in the figure you can see on the screen now, you, you will find some of the focus areas that we have identified uh, which is important to uh, investigate uh, prior to use uh, of biofuels. Uh, in general, our recommendation is to ensure dialogue with fuel suppliers, fuel uh, laboratories, engine makers and suppliers of relevant subsystems on board the vessel uh, to make sure uh, that the transition to uh, biofuels runs as smoothly as possible. Uh, monitoring is also key once uh, biofuel is bunkered to make sure that any potential uh, challenges are identified uh, as quickly as possible. Uh, finally, uh, getting back to um, the main question uh, on the uh, agenda, uh, is biofuels uh, a real uh, option? Uh, we certainly think uh, it is, especially uh, in the short uh, to medium term, where liquid uh, biofuels may serve as an important uh, decarbonization pathway for uh, especially existing 
uh, vessels with with few uh, other options to to achieve um, significant uh, emissions reduction. Uh, in the example shown uh, on the screen, we see a vessel progressively using uh, biofuels in order to meet uh, greenhouse gas emission uh, requirements until its end of lifetime. And it is this flexibility of being able to use uh, fuels containing uh, fossil fuels in combination with biofuels that makes it uh, an especially appealing uh, decarbonization pathway for many vessels. Uh, we expect that uh, the uptake of biofuels will be incentivized by greenhouse gas uh, regulations such as uh, CII and EU uh, ETS, um, as well as fuel EU maritime, uh, and also pressure from other uh, stakeholders such as uh, cargo owners. Uh, keeping all this in mind, uh, although there is a significant potential to increase the supply of biofuels to shipping from today's very low uh, level, it's important that uh, sustain sustainability um, uh, is considered and that any expanded biofuel usage within shipping is based on biofuels from uh, sustainable feedstocks. Uh, I will now give uh, give the floor back to you, uh, Christos. Thanks for listening. Thank you, David. Um, so now uh, we're moving on to the uh, next big topic, which is methanol, the next uh, big fuel that is coming. And here we start seeing some of the statistics uh, from our alternative fuels inside the portal, showing the rapid increase in uh, new building orders for methanol as fuel. Um, as uh, we say, this is mainly coming through containers, and we have several tankers, mainly the methanol tankers so far that are in operation. But we have started seeing that these data were updated in January, but we have already, later this year, in February, we have already seen more orders of containers and even bulk carriers now um, with methanol as fuel. And we start seeing interest from all ship types. Um, methanol is easier to handle than uh, LNG. Uh, that also means building a vessel with methanol as fuel is a little bit cheaper. On the other hand, you again have to compromise uh, some cargo space and uh, you have to uh, make sure that uh, you take the necessary uh, precautions to make sure that you handle this fuel safely because it's a low flash point fuel and uh, it also has some toxicity. Um, we already have quite significant experience from methanol tankers that are already in operation for some years now. And we are very proud that most of these vessels are uh, built um, with DMV class, so we have actually learned a lot. We are ready now to take this experience to uh, the other sea types that uh, start investing in methanol. So now I would like to pass the word over to uh, Evan Skora, who is going to tell us a bit more about the requirements for in a methanol fuel vessel. David, have control. Thank you very much, Christos, and good evening and good morning to, to all of you. Uh, my name is Evan Skora. I've been working with Alternative Fuel for some years now, and I was asked if I could say something about the regulatory status and also maybe some of the technical issues with methanol as fuel. So if any of, any of you attended the, the previous webinar about this subject, um, there hasn't been that much uh, new on the front of the regulatory status. Still, the statutory requirements for methanol as fuel is the IMO guidelines, that's the MSE circular 1621, and of course we have our class rules, which are currently being updated. Uh, in addition to that, of course, we also had the fuel ready notation, and uh, that has become a very, very popular notation uh, the last years. And of course, a lot of our clients, they choose methanol as one of their preferred fuels to be ready for. So that's, uh, that is a trend that we see quite strongly now. So, um, as I said, Circular 1621, it's still the one that's existing in IMO. Uh, it is still guidelines. So by definition, they are not mandatory. So what we in DNE has been doing the last year is that we have contacted a lot of flag administrations in order to obtain their, uh, how can I say, prior acceptance for use of this circular as basis uh, of approval of the design, instead of having a full alternative design view, which no one really wants to go through. 
It has also been decided in IMO that the guidelines will, of course, be part of the, of the IGF code at some point. Uh, so the text is aimed to be concluded in 2025, and that will subsequently mean that in best case scenario, uh, this will enter into force as mandatory in about 2028. Well, that is uh, still some years to go. So in the meantime, of course, we in DNV and also IAX and, and flag administrations are now working on approving, improving the text of the existing guidelines. Um, you know, they were quite fresh uh, when they came and uh, based on a lot of experience we've had with designers and shipyards, we know that, okay, some of the rule text in these guidelines are perhaps not the best and it perhaps doesn't really fit to the reality that we see is necessary for designing different ship types to run on methanol. So we hope that uh, the industry is willing to, to also contribute and try to improve uh, the rules before they become mandatory. Then it's becoming much more difficult afterwards. Some of the issues that we have seen in DNV is uh, typically uh, venting of fuel tanks and the install, installation of PV valves and gas zones around on the ship types that has not been needing to deal with this before. Of course, our experience with the methanol fuel ships has been related mainly to chemical tankers where this is not really a problem, but for cruise ships and other vessels that uh, has a quite different way of operating, then alternative solutions have been proposed to the NV and we have accepted to some of them. So please contact us if you should have uh, any needs uh, in order to see something beyond what's already written in the IMO guidelines. We in DND, we have also tried to focus a little bit more on the toxicity of methanol compared to the existing guidelines. Um, there is a reason why maybe it's some of the requirements are not the same because when the IMO guidelines were created, then IMO by definition did not say that methanol was toxic. That was the, I think that was a little bit after the guidelines were published. I also wanted to just mention briefly a little bit about methanol spills or leaks. Uh, we got a lot of questions about this. And one of the venting solutions that's being proposed in IMO, for instance, for gas freeing, and also we in DNV, we will accept in some cases that you may have your vents rooted on the water. And that's okay, how, how uh, environmental friendly or hazardous is methanol if you spill it into the ocean? Well, it's significantly less impact than conventional hydrocarbon fuels. It dissolves very easily in water and you need very high concentrations to create any lethal conditions or any changing effects on the local marine life. So basically this means that a spill results in quite limited damage to the environment and methanol is actually quite common already in the sea. It's produced naturally by phytoplankton and it's consumed by a lot of bacteria and microbes in the ocean. So that's not, of course, there are strict requirements as well for in the, in the rules for discharging and cargo residues and things like that. And those are, of course, to be followed. But this is just for information. If it comes to, for instance, gas freeing your tanks underwater, it's an opening that I'm all out. So, of course, we need to talk a little bit about the safety risks of methanol. When it comes to, to the toxicity, it is quite toxic. If it's being ingested, uh, it may cause serious damage to your central nervous system and may cause blindness, coma, and in worst case, death if you ingest too much of it. So it needs to be handled carefully, means, which means that the crew on board a methanol fuel ship needs to know the main differences between methanol and, for instance, NGO, if that's what you were used to as or having on board the ship, because it does have quite different safety issues. The vapor is heavier than air, so it's very important that the uh, spaces where you can have methanol spills and uh, vapors are properly ventilated. And we, went, of course, need to talk about the explosion risks. So fuel vapors in tanks and enclosed spaces after a spill is something we need to be aware of. Air in other spaces is, an, is, a, is a definitely an issue. That's why it's required that uh, all of the fuel tank needs to be inerted uh, during normal operation, which means that if you have a methanol fuel vessel, we will always recommend you to have a nitrogen generator on board so that you can uh, replace uh, what is spent. 
should not be air into the tanks during normal operation. And if there should be, then of course sparks and static discharges, lightning storms, for instance, it's a, it can be a problem. And especially during when you're doing tank cleaning and gas spraying and when you're, when you're doing tank entry, then this has become very important because methanol has a flash point of about 11 to 12 degrees centigrade, which means that basically it creates a flammable uh, gas at any time when you have it on board. So here we have just shown uh, like a big draft of, of a one ship uh, type, which is a chemical tanker, which we have quite good experience with. Um, so, but of course, a lot of these points that I'm bringing up here is totally relevant for other ship types as well. So you need to have some service tanks for, uh, and maybe some return tanks for, for methanol. Uh, you need to probably have a few preparation rooms installed. I think all of the concepts that we have seen uh, demands so high pressures that a separate fuel preparation room will be necessary. I already mentioned about uh, the nitrogen. Uh, you need to have some nitrogen lines and then, uh, probably a nitrogen generator. On a chemical tanker, you will need to focus on separation of the cargo and the fuel system, so you don't necessarily get cargo into your fuel system. Uh, on other ships, the segregation is equally important, maybe even more, but then it's more about protecting your ship against methanol coming into other systems. Because for instance, if you get methanol into your conventional fuel oil system, then uh, you suddenly have single wall pipes in your engine room and you might suddenly have methanol vapors and leakages in the, and, uh, in the engine room and that needs to be avoided. When it comes to the tank system itself, it, uh, you will need about two to two and a half times the volume, um, the volume as you would for MGO over a certain defined uh, distance journey. So of course that is an issue for many. And in most cases, you will need to have quite a lot of coffer dams surrounding your fuel tanks. And that also is quite space consuming. Uh, there are quite strict requirements to coffer dam dimensions. So of course, that's, a, that's something that needs to be very thoroughly evaluated for ship owners. Okay, maybe my bunkering uh, intervals will have to change if actually I have to go to methanol. Maybe that's the only, maybe that's the only possibility I would have. Um, yeah, gas tones I already mentioned, uh, and of course, engines here, they are available. There are some few types that are type approved right now, but there are not that many to choose from, sadly, yet. But of course, we know that, uh, that um, the major engine manufacturers are working on it already. Uh, so I believe within the next year or so, we will see uh, more of the four-stroke engines being available, generators. Uh, we already have the MAN uh, two-stroke engines on these tankers, for instance, that's already type approved. But of course, in order for to have a big market uh, and many owners converting to actually operating on methanol right now, we need, of course, the engine manufacturers to also uh, finish up their, uh, their development of these engines. And then we will also gain a little bit more of operational experience related to different ship types and different operation patterns. So that was me. Uh, leave it back to Christos. Thank you all for, for listening. Thank you very much, Evans. Uh, so now I would like to take us to the final part. Uh, before concluding, uh, very quickly, I would like to mention some wild cards. We are getting uh, many questions about that. One is nuclear propulsion. Um, here, uh, we expect the first marinized reactors to be ready at the end of this decade, around 2030. And this is the words of the technology developers. And then the first vessels could be ready by around 2035. So uh, this is assuming, of course, that the technology development will go well. And uh, that means that, uh, yes, this can be a promising technology. Um, there are quite a lot of question marks yet, but we cannot wait for it. Uh, we need to do something else. Uh, and if this works, maybe that could be a solution for the next generation of ships. But in the meantime, we need to uh, take action. The other technology that is uh, discussed more and more uh, is onboard carbon capture. Uh, there are many who think that this might be a better option than having alternative fuels on board. Uh, or in some cases, you may want to combine it with some alternative fuels. Uh, we already see a lot of piloting on, uh, on vessels, and uh, we are also involved in some uh, projects. Uh, 
So one thing is the technology on board that is under development, and I think this can uh, be made to work. Of course, you need to remember that you need a CO2 tank to store that hydrogen on board for a while. Uh, another part uh, that is important is the regulatory development and uh, the discussion both in the IMO and in the European Union has just started. So we need to see how this develops and if this is going to be accepted uh, solution. And finally, we have the land-based infrastructure that has to be developed. Uh, facilities for delivering the captured CO2 at ports and also making sure that this can be safely stored underground or used for other purposes and uh, this should be documented to make sure that the CO2 does not escape in the atmosphere again. So this is another technology that is also under development together with the regulatory framework and the um, uh, required land-based infrastructure but again uh, this is not something that you can readily order for a vessel uh, immediately. So with that, I would like to uh, finish, uh, first of all, to remind you all uh, the statistics you have seen are based on our Alternative Fuels Insight portal. You can uh, register if you are not already a registered user and uh, uh, use the statistics there. We also have some reports coming up. Uh, we have an Alternative Fuels for Containers report that is already available. Uh, it is uh, being updated as we speak. It will be released a new version in April. And we also have a, a new report coming in May looking at uh, fuels going to all transport sectors. So we're trying to understand uh, the competition with other transport sectors, uh, mainly automotive and aviation. And uh, I would like to summarize by saying that uh, we are going through uh, a fuel uh, transition in shipping. This is happening as we speak, mainly driven by regulations, but also we see a lot of other market forces and other industry stakeholders increasing, increasing the pressure. The interest for LNG, I uh, think, is well established and it's continuing, mainly for large vessels. We see a very rapid growth for methanol. Uh, we expect this to come uh, to become bigger than what it is um, in the near future, in the very near future. And then, of course, uh, the big question mark is about biofuels. Uh, is the availability going to be in place? And I think the same question goes for all green fuels, also like including electrofuels. We also see uh, developments for ammonia and hydrogen technology. And we see a lot of interest actually in the market for when these solutions are going to be commercially available. And of course, we have the wild cards that we just talked about. And um, they can be a solution for the future, but in the meantime, we need to take action. 